Hello everyone, welcome to MATLAB and Simling Racing Launch. Today, we are going to talk about vehicle part tracking using Stanley controller. And to talk about this, I have my colleague David Barnes. So David, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey everybody, my name is David Barnes. I'm an engineer here in the engineering development group. I've had the opportunity to work with Veer on this new project where we're going to be looking at vehicle path tracking using a Stanley controller. Awesome. So uh, David, why don't you show us some pictures, some videos, what we are going to see today? Awesome, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, as you can see, we're gonna have this car that's gonna be exiting this highway off towards the right. As it's gonna be sweeping, you'll see the vehicle being able to be controlled both in its longitudinal and its lateral direction as it's going through and making some velocity sweeps. And we'll be following it as it goes back off towards the left as well. Awesome, so let's move to the agenda and see what all we are going to cover today. So we're gonna look at the Stanley controller itself We'll take a look at its implementation, uh, starting with generation of waypoints, and then moving on to actually implementing this and building the models in Simulink, and of course, doing all of these visualizations for the vehicle motion. And of course, we'll wrap up with some key takeaways for you all. Okay, so basically, we are going to focus mostly on the implementation part. Yes. For those of you that don't know, the Stanley controller has been around for a little while, and it's actually a path tracking algorithm. It was actually first used in real life in the Stanford Racing Team in the DARPA Grand Challenge, and it's using and computing the steering wheel angle to follow a reference trajectory. Um, we don't want to get into the, all the details for the derivation of this, but you can feel free to look at the reference here. So basically, we have taken this formula from the reference what we have provided, and if you want to know more, you can refer to the paper. So let's take a look at how this is actually implemented with our products. We're first going to start by generating the waypoints in Driving Scenario Designer. Then we'll move over into actually calculating some of the reference input parameters for our Simulink model using a MATLAB live script. Then we'll actually build the vehicle and the controller model in Simulink. And finally wrap up with visualizing all of this motion in bird's eye view, two-dimensional plots, as well as the 3D environment using Unreal. Let's go to MATLAB and get started. So let's first open up the Driving Scenario Designer, coming over here to the apps. I happen to have it start, but you can also search for it up here at the top, Driving Scenario Designer. We can get started by actually adding the road to the Scenario Canvas. Once we click on the Add Road button, we're able to just click the waypoints. And as we're clicking through, we're going to be adding these as our road centers, and then hitting the Enter button. Driving Scenario will generate our road for us. We can go ahead and add an actor, and there's several options for you to choose from, including cars, and pedestrians, or bicycles. We'll get started today with just adding a car to our scenario. We'll start by clicking on there to add our actor as its initial point, and then we can right-click on it and add forward waypoints. Once we're here, we can continue to click through on these road centers and show the path that we want this vehicle to follow. Again, hitting Enter, we'll save these waypoints, and we can visualize this within Driving Scenario Designer, by hitting the run button. As you can see, this vehicle oscillates back and forth following with these waypoints. And if you want to, you can change the vehicle's uh, constant velocity here. We can save this as a scenario file, mm -hmm. and this is going to save a ton of information from the scenario, including the road information, information about the actors, as well as any sensors you might have added. Once we've saved this, we can then call this from a live script. Now that we've saved our scenario file and exported it from Driving Scenario Designer, We've saved it here as single track. We can now use this in our live script. The script that we have here is going to set up everything for our Simulink model. The first thing it will do is add in some of the images that we use in the model, but then we're actually going to load in scene files. We're going to grab the waypoints from the references that are in there from the actor specifications, and then we'll define those waypoints based on the X and the Y values as the first and the second column. Then we need to give some of the blocks the initial position of the vehicle, so we can just grab the first element in those reference vectors. Some of the other information that we'll need is going to include the distance vector to see how far along the vehicle is moving along its path. So after calculating that, we will also linearize and smooth this data so that it's nice and clean for our simulated model. We'll also need to calculate the angle for it. This is using the ATAN 2D, which is the four quadrant tangent calculation, and it's going to output all the values in degrees. And then again, smoothing this and grabbing some initial values for the yaw angle. 
Next, we'll also need to create the direction vector. This is just simple vector of ones because it's always moving forward. And the chance that you have a scenario where you're moving forwards and backwards, you can use negative one for those directions. Then we're going to calculate the curvature using just a simple curvature calculation function down at the bottom for our x and our y values. And we'll be all ready and get started with our model. OK, David, thanks for covering that. So it means that uh, it is not necessary that uh, the user has to uh, grab the waypoints from the uh, uh, driving scenario designer, even though if they are having some kind of test data, so they can have the values over here and then they can go through the same procedure. Exactly. So yeah. Awesome. With all of these values calculated, we can go ahead and go to the model. Now that we've got the model open, we can go ahead and take a look at the different components for it. The first, starting over on the left, is the reference data. We went through and calculated all of these different values as a function of the vehicle's distance. So as we input the vehicle's velocity, we're just going to simply integrate that to see how far along its path it is. And then we'll be outputting from these simple lookup tables the x values, y values, angle, as well as its curvature and direction. OK, OK, awesome. Yeah. And now that we have all of those states, we can actually pass this in to the Stanley controller. So using the um, automated driving toolbox implementation of the Stanley controller, it's relatively simple for you to get started with the kinematic bicycle model. All that you need to do is change the gains for your forward motion as well as your reverse, and then give it some specifications about your vehicle, such as its total wheelbase, as well as the maximum steering angle that you want for your controller. So yeah, and, and I think uh, uh, the advantage in using Stanley controller is that we do have an upper bound, like for here, we are using a maximum steering angle, which we have kept 35. So yeah, awesome. Exactly. Now that we have everything defined and our controller ready, all we have to do is pull these signals into the three degree of freedom vehicle body to do all of these calculations. For this simulation, we're using just a constant velocity that will change. But let's go ahead and see how the simulation runs. As you can see, the vehicle is following the path fairly well. As it's moving through, you'll have it a little bit of cross track error as it's going but it will slowly start to match over the course of some time. So now that our controller is working fairly well, let's see what happens if we increase the velocity a little bit. So we can go ahead and increase this velocity from 8 meters per second to, let's say, 12 meters per second, just a little bit faster. Now when we run the simulation, let's see how our controller responds. After the model compiles, we'll see that the vehicle starts off doing fairly well in terms of its track, but uh, okay, I mean, I can see some deviation. <laughs> yes, quite a bit from this controller. And as you can see, as the curvature starts to kind of increase for the waypoints, the vehicle definitely has a little bit of spin off as it goes in its different directions. But we can actually make this a whole lot better by switching the type of Stanley implementation that we're using. And that's going to be moving and switching the actual type of model that's used in the Stanley controller. This is going to be taking and moving from this vehicle model of a kinematic bicycle model which is a little bit unstable in terms of its system, to the dynamic model. So with these new values, we actually have new ports that become available. Uh, starting from the top, one of the first ones is curvature, which we fortunately already have calculated using the reference data. So I'll go ahead and connect that here. The next is going to be the current yaw rate, which we already get out of our 3 degree of freedom dual track model, which is this value r. And I can just right click this signal and drag it in. And then the next is the current steering rate. And so we'll be able to use that by passing it into a unit delay block and get this connected in. To the so this is basically to avoid the algebraic loop. Exactly. Correct. Now that we have our model ready to go, I'm going to turn off simulation pacing now that we've seen it a few times. And we'll go ahead and let this model run. As you see, the model runs quite quickly without simulation ah, pacing. Okay. And we have fantastic values in terms of how our vehicle is responding to this high high velocity as well um, as the curves. So yeah, David, this, this looks great. And uh, just a question. So the parameters, the vehicle parameters, what you defined when you selected the dynamics uh, model in the lateral controller. So are those also defined in the vehicle body 3D, 3D of dual track? Yes, they certainly are. You want to make sure that all of those values match as you're kind of making sure that your vehicle is there. And you can find these kind of hidden into these different options here for your vehicle parameters, okay. 
you'll have those matching here, such as your vehicle mass and those distances to the flat okay. axles. Is there a way where we can compare all these results and, and have a proper visualization? Yes, we certainly do. And that's going to be using the Simulink Data Inspector. So we've already saved this from some previous runs. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that. And what we can see from here is based off of the different parameters that we had, such as the type of model that's used in the Stanley controller, as well as those gains, we can actually press play down here at the bottom and watch and see these values as a function of time, as well as their positions X and Y. So that's a great tool because it is showing the XY comparison and also the steering command comparison. Awesome. Now that we've seen a fairly simple model, let's see what happens when we increase some of the fidelity for our models. But we're adding in higher fidelity by modeling the powertrain and the driveline in this block right here. By going in, we have created a simple powertrain model, as well as some drive lines, braking systems, um, as well as adding in the brakes and wheels subsystem. And uh, uh, so David, if you can click on the brakes and wheels, so this tire has been taken from the vehicle dynamics block. Correct. Yes. Now that we've had this powertrain model, we actually have a little bit of a change to our vehicle dynamics block. Instead of having a constant input or maybe a changing input for your velocity, we're now modeling the velocity changes based on the forces on the front and the rear axles. This means that we'll take our calculated vehicle velocity and change this into a distance. This will allow us to then be able to control the velocity using a Stanley based controller. Based on this position of the vehicle, similar to how we have our other states, we're now going to have a velocity to control for in our Stanley based controller. That's going to be a combined longitudinal and lateral controller. So let's take a look. In here, we have our same Stanley controller for our lateral dynamics. That's going to be taking into account our states and it's going to be using the dynamic bicycle model so that we have this nice clean control. But we're also going to have the longitudinal control here based off of the current velocity and the direction of the vehicle. This is also very similar where we're using this uh, simple controller with a proportional and an interval gain and with a specified sample time. We're also going to use vehicle parameters like the maximum and minimum uh, longitudinal acceleration and deceleration rates. So David, this is basically to uh, track the velocity reference. Exactly. So now we'll be able to control okay. the vehicle's position as well as how fast it's going. Okay, like in the last model, we were just having constant velocity. Now we have a varying velocity, a reference velocity for this part. Correct. So that's awesome. That's a good addition to the model. Yes. So now let's see where this velocity profile is actually coming from. It's in this script here that's hyperlinked in this link. And feel free to take a look at this script to see how we're using the trapezoidal rule to calculate and smooth out a velocity based off of the map of its position. And then going back to the model, we've added some additional ways that we can visualize this vehicle. We still have our 2D visualization with that XY plotter that's available in some of the other vehicle dynamic block sets, as well as adding in the 3D visualization in Unreal using just these two blocks. There's also the opportunity to use the bird's eye scope using the block that's here and is readily available using the bird's eye scope up here at the top ribbon. Now that we have the bird's eye scope set up, we're ready to run the simulation. By pressing run either here or in the simulation tab, we can watch all of our different visualization options. And here we go. Now we have the vehicle moving along its path similar to the video that we saw earlier. Now that the simulation has finished, we can actually see that the circles that were previously uniform now have sections that are scrunched up and more spread apart. And this is based on the vehicle's velocity changing as a function of the path. So now we're able to see that across our simulation, the Stanley controllers were able to fairly well keep both the longitudinal and the lateral states of the vehicle intact. OK, that's great. These were using the automated driving toolboxes implementation, but there's also some available in the vehicle dynamics block set. So David, can you show the block in the library browser where we can find it in the vehicle dynamics block set? Certainly can. Opening up the library browser, we can actually see where the original blocks came from here out of the automated driving toolbox. They're coming here out of your vehicle control, and then you have your lateral Stanley controller as well as your longitudinal one. 
or going all the way down to the vehicle dynamics block set. We can see that these are available here in your vehicle scenarios and then moving into the different driver models that are available. You'll have these available as a lateral driver, a longitudinal one, or available as the combined in the predictive driver as well. So David, do we have any example where we can see the implementation of this predictive driver where we can select the option for the Stanley controller? Yes, we do. Actually shipping in 21A, there's a new example reference application that I think would be perfect. As you can see, this is a very similar layout to the model that we had before, where we have some reference values coming from here, whereas instead of hard calculations, it's this oval track reference, but we can see the implementation of the predictive driver here in this model. Opening up this combined longitudinal and lateral driver, we see that actually the lateral control type can be either Stanley or predictive. So we are also defining the same parameters what we defined in the previous block. So David, can you show that where we are defining those parameters? Certainly. So over here under the reference control, we can see that the Stanley value still has these gains associated with it. And we're still also passing in vehicle parameters here shown as a part of the struct for the vehicle. So, and uh, David, do we have any extra visualization in this one? Because I can see a subsystem in the visualization. So can you go inside that and uh, show the viewers what extra we got? Exactly. So just similar to what we had, there's the 3D visualization using Unreal. There's also a brand new GG plotter that's available for the simulation. Let's go ahead and run the model and see what this looks like. As you can see, we're gonna have a little bit more information about the vehicle forces that are involved and the velocity on the tires. But we also now have this new GG diagram which shows as the vehicle goes around the track, how these accelerations are actually occurring. Okay, that's that's awesome, uh, David, because uh, I think uh, the GG plotter addition in this model is very much relevant to the racing teams. So that's great, David. Uh, I think we have seen all the models. So can we go to the key takeaways of this video? Yeah. So today we've gotten to see quite a few different things. But first off was showing how we can smooth some of these reference input parameters. And that's going to be a very important step for you as you're going to continue developing your own models so that you have really good tracking. And a lot of that has to come into the second point, which is based on higher velocities and varying curvatures. Combining these lateral and longitudinal dynamics are really going to give you better path tracking results based on that nice smooth data. And MATLAB and Simulink do provide you a whole lot of algorithms and tools for doing these different parts of the process, from generating some of these waypoints to building the vehicle model and the controllers, and also visualizing these in different levels of fidelity in different environments. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, and for all the viewers, if you want to contact us, you can contact us at racinglaunch at mathworks.com. And feel free to join our Facebook group where we keep on uh, sharing the latest technical resources and even uh, updates regarding our upcoming webinars. And for more uh, videos and tutorials, you can visit the student tutorials and videos website. So with this, we come at the end of the video. And uh, yeah, thanks David, that was a great presentation and uh, we covered a lot of things like implementation of Stanley control using MATLAB and Simlink. Thank you so much.